Hello and welcome to this episode of Not So Fast. Uh, in this episode, we are going to look at uh, Newton's first law of motion and try to understand why it is necessary. Now, why would I query about this? Well, if you start typing on Google uh, any search related to the first law of Newton, uh, well, here I started with derived Newtons, but in, in fact, if you do Newton's first law and so on, you are going to find similar results. You're going to find that the first answer you find is to do with deriving Newton's first law from Newton's second law. And indeed, um, you know, uh, to illustrate this fact, I've just taken uh, a couple of screenshots of the kind of links uh, you get to by looking at the answers there. So what you can see here is that a typical query is whether Newton's first law is necessary or whether it's redundant or whether it's vacuous even or how it can be obtained from Newton's second law. And this particular video is precisely to address this particular question, which is so frequent. And to be honest, I've also, as a student, uh, been guilty of thinking that Newton's first law uh, was redundant. Uh, I don't believe so anymore, and I'm going to explain why. So first, let's understand why uh, people might think that Newton's first law uh, can be derived from Newton's second law. So we've got um, Newton's first law that states uh, in substance something like this. Everybody remains in the state of rest or uniform right line motion unless it is subject to a net external force. That's how it should be kind of interpreted. Now, it's often summarized as uh, an equation which states the following, A equals to zero. Now, that's a shorthand for the acceleration of the body or of the object is zero if there is no force acting on it. Okay, so that's what it means. Now, if we look at Newton's second law, we are going to find the following the famous F equals MA. Now the arrows, by the way, on top of the letter F and A simply mean and remind us that forces and acceleration have a magnitude and a direction. Now, if I set or assign the value zero to the force uh, in this equation, then automatically from the equality, I'm going to get zero as well for the acceleration. Now, what it means in practice is that if f is equal to zero, then Newton's second law is actually telling me that a is equal to zero. Now, we could derive Newton's first law as a specific case of Newton's second law. Well, it turns out that actually no. Um, and what happens here is that what we derived, yes, is an equation, but this equation is not what Newton's first law is about and we are going to understand and see why. So to appreciate that, let's have a look at a situation where we've got two observers. The first one called Alice and the second one called Bob. Now the trick here is that Bob and Alice are in relative motion with respect to each other. So what that means in practice is that Bob is moving relative to Alice and vice versa. Now, because they are moving with respect to each other, if we make them look at the same object you know, undergoing its own motion, they are going to observe two different trajectories. For example, here we've got two set of axes in, uh, in two dimensions, so X and Y. Now, what you see is that uh, you could have these two trajectories as time goes. So Alice would observe a right line motion, and that is uniform, so it's uniformly moving in a right line, while Bob would observe a curved motion, here that looks like a branch of parabola. Now the point here is that if Alice and Bob do not know whether there are any forces acting on this object, then the only thing that they can try relying on uh, Newton's uh, second law is to try to infer whether there are forces acting or not uh, based on, on this law only. So if they only use this law, then they are going to say uh, for Alice that, well, there is no force acting on this, on this object, and while Bob is going to conclude that there are forces acting on this object.
Now the point here when we reach this particular conclusion is to understand whether there is a problem uh, with these two statements. Are they contradicting each other? Well, they are not contradicting each other in so far as Newton's second law is concerned. In fact, uh, they, Alice and Bob, apply the second law of Newton and they simply observe then f equals zero for Alice and f is different from zero for Bob. Now the problem though is that it contradicts Newton's understanding and view of forces. For him, uh, forces uh, are actually physical objects as tangible as a table, a chair, or whatever you are used to, to use uh, in a daily basis uh, in real life. And as a result, they can't depend uh, on, on the observer. They are not relative concepts. So that's the reason why Newton introduced his first law in the first place. So let's have a look at the first law uh, that we um, discussed earlier. What we did is summarized it with the equation a equals zero. But in doing so, we actually omitted something. a is equal to zero, but for whom? The problem here is that, as we've seen, Alice and Bob, if they are in relative motion with respect to each other, they are going to witness different accelerations. And therefore, the statement A is equal to zero has to refer to a specific kind of observer as a subtext of uh, Newton's first law. So the meaning of A equals zero here is that it, this is basically a defining feature of the right kind of observers. Um, so the right kind in, the, in this setting is the kind of observers who are going to observe uh, basically a, a, a state of motion of rest or uniform right line motion unless the object concerned is subject to a net force. So that's basically how it's defined. As a result, what happens is that we don't have two observers anymore in our problem. We actually have Alice, Bob, and then the third observer to whom the, uh, the statement is directed to. So this uh, particular observer is so-called the inertial uh, observer. And this is the only kind of observer that can make a conclusion about the existence or non-existence of forces. As a result, what happens is that when we reach this situation, you see I've crossed uh, the two uh, situations here, f equals zero and f is different from zero. That's because now we are not applying anymore Newton's second law only, but we are using the first law as well. And these, these basically judgments become invalid um, as soon as the first law is introduced and if neither Alice nor Bob are inertial observer. So, to summarize this particular uh, point, what we've seen is that if we only cared about Newton's second law, then the conclusion would be that forces are relative to the observer and basically dependent on the kind of motion you're having. Now, this is not uh, in agreement with Newton's philosophy about what forces should be about. And Newton's first law essentially establishes the reality of forces, and it does so by uh, setting apart a class of observers which are the only one, or only ones, that can actually see forces or not for through the actions on the motion of objects. And if you are not in such a, a frame or a privileged frame of observation, then essentially you can't conclude anything about uh, about the existence or not of forces. And that's why Newton's first law is necessary.